Blessings, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. And I've been wanting to speak with my guest for quite a while. Um, and it finally worked today um, with God's, God's grace. Um, my guest is Mark Hackard, and he is, Mark, I'd call you an expert on Russian literature and history. Is that okay? Oh, thanks. <laughs> to, to some, yeah, literature, just, uh, you know, I mean, I love, I, I do love Dostoevsky, so that's, Okay. You know, some aspects could, of that. Yeah. Could, could you introduce yourself? I know you went to Stanford, so a little bit, maybe a little bit about yourself. Sure. Yeah. Um, let's see. I, uh, I grew up in California and then I, uh, I went to undergrad at Georgetown. I oh, did my, wow. uh, yeah, I, I studied in Russia. Um, I did my, my, my major was Russian. I, I did, um, I did my, uh, graduate degree, my master's at Stanford, Russian studies. Um, and then I worked in DC for a while and have since come down, come back to California. You know, I've been here, you know, over a decade now. So, um, and yeah, I love, I, uh, for whatever reason, you know, my, my, uh, when I was 10, my dad get, got me a book on the KGB. And um, <clears throat> that kind of sent the wheelies, wheels spinning, you know, and uh, and ever since then, I've, I've been fascinated uh, with uh, Russia, Russian history, culture, um, you know, the geopolitics. And um, so, yeah, that that more or less kind of um, sums it up. I have a couple projects online, uh, Soul of the East, yeah. which most, yeah, deals with like you know, philosophy stuff and espionage history archive, which is, you know, about intelligence history. Um, I, I translate a lot of K KGB memoirs. I mean, I haven't been uh, very active or anything past few years, um, but now and then I put something new up. So uh, yeah, I, I enjoy translating or when I find something cool or, you know, um, you know, kind of intriguing to write about, I'll, I'll, I'll do that now and then. That's that's how I found you quite a few years ago was the Soul of the East website. It's really good. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah, because you had quite a bit of Dostoevsky stuff on there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was interested. Yeah, yeah. I uh, recently did a, a podcast with my friend Jay, and yeah. you know we were talking about Dostoevsky and and this book uh, by a guy named Bachinian. It's in Russian, but it's called uh, Dostoevsky and the Metaphysics of Crime. And it's all about um, kind of the uh, the criminal mentality or the the, uh, the will to transgression and you know the the spiritual and metaphysical aspects of that and in his novels. And I've I've translated parts of this and and, and parts of Bachinin's book are are actually on the site Soul of the East. So I I should do more because there's a lot of fascinating chapters in there. Um, but yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I enjoy that type of analysis and, um, yeah, it's, it's just, uh, for whatever reason I was, I was drawn to, you know, uh, Russian history, culture, literature, all that stuff. Same here. Now, um, um, can you, you speak, you speak Russian and read Russian. So you, you, and you can also translate it. Yeah, it's fun. Um. Yeah, so I, let's see. Uh, yeah, and the fact that on, on the, uh, Jay's podcast, his friend Tristan, who's another, he's another podcaster, he's also Orthodox. And um, Tristan was asking me what, what translation is best. And I, I mean, I, I had to tell, well, I like, to, I like to read it in Russian, you know. So, but from what I hear, the Valachonsky, Valachonsky translation, those are, those are pretty good. So, um, yeah. I'm not sure which one I got. Yeah, yeah. They, there's, there's different uh, because there are different. Like Constance Gardner was an earlier one, but Volochonsky is a, uh, her her translations are are pretty good. So, no, yeah. no. When 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 were you in Russia? Uh, let's see. The early uh, was there a couple times. Uh, early two thousands. Yeah, just just studying and you know visiting. Um, Where and, were you? In, in Moscow or Saint yeah, Peter? Moscow, Petersburg, okay. and gosh, it's been a while. And I, you know, and I dream about. Um, it's been a while since I visited Moscow, and I, I, you know, I have dreams about it. So when everything um, 
when everything uh, settles down, you know, <laughs> I do hope to get get back and visit eventually. So yeah. Oh, I, I've never been there, but I would. It's an I awesome place. Yeah. Love just because of my background in in art history, I would love. Yeah, you would think it was cool. Yeah, yeah I love. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So the 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 focus of this podcast, I, I'm hoping, is um. Uh, Father Seraphim's Rose. Uh, Rose's book, <laughs> yeah. Nihilism, uh, yeah. the root of the revelation, revolution of the modern age. I talked about it a little bit in my previous podcast with um, Patrick. Yeah, uh, that was great. With David Patrick here, yeah. You guys did a great job. I, I enjoyed that a lot. Oh, yeah. thank you. He, I thought, I mean, he did. He's a smart guy. Oh, he's, um, yeah, he's a super smart dude. Yeah, but, you know, you. I mean, both of you guys, uh, it, was, it was a very in-depth discussion. I liked it a lot. Thank you. I, I I just try to keep up. So um, when when I first got interested in Dostoevsky was when I was at Berkeley in the in the nineties. Um, I had a, a class on uh, French Impressionism, and I got interested in. But I also got interested in literature that that is um, associated with like art movements. So um, I got interested in you know modernism. Um, the the culture of leisure and sort of boredom in post in the post industrial world, it's it's that's kind of a niche subject. And I got um, um, introduced to Flaubert, Gustave Flaubert's Madame Bovary, and I just got real obsessed with that book. And then um, it's, and then somebody introduced me to Tolstoy's Anna Karenina, which they're they're kind of similar. They're both about um, women sort of the same time period women who have extramarital affairs and then commit suicide mm -hmm. um and then so so i think Tol tolstoy is sort of the gateway i thought for me it's like the gateway drug to dostoevsky yeah yeah because <laughs> i thought tolstoy was fairly easy to read i mean i'm reading it in english mark well he's he's yeah tolstoy <laughs> is like he's super detailed he's he's got a real sense of uh -huh. you know the the historical time period you know like his his descriptions of the you know the the battles you know like Baraj, Barajino or you know these different yeah the uh, the Napoleonic campaign the invasion of Russia and, and uh yeah the the patriotic war um uh but yeah D Dostoevsky goes deeper you know that's that's I, what I, Dostoevsky. I yeah I found Dostoevsky much more dense um so the first book I picked up is the demons which is crazy so I couldn't read it. I, I read a bit of it. And then I picked up Crime and Punishment and I couldn't read it. I just couldn't get through it. And then I picked up The Brothers Karamazov and I was really determined to finish it. And I did. And I really, I love that book. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> so it's the only, it's the only Dostoevsky book that I've read all the way through and read a couple of times. Wow. You, you may like, I mean, Demons is a cool book too. There's there's a ton of there's a ton of nihilism in that as well. Yeah. Um, if if you may want to give it a second try, I mean, I, I it's not not you don't have to, but yeah, it's uh, but but I would say that Brothers Karamazov is his, you know, his ultimate work. And would you, you know, say was, it, yeah? Would you say it's the most accessible to the layperson? To I I would think. I think crime and punishment oh, okay yeah if i were to guess i would say crime and punishment maybe um but uh brothers karamazov is the most um philosophically expansive mm. and uh profound you know so um you know it kind of it's kind of the uh it it really encompasses all his other work uh and kind of it's the it's the summation yeah and i mean that and that was his last novel before he died in 1881 okay my reading of it is probably a lot more shallow than yours but i mean i did get uh, even at the depth that i was able to go so um real quick so it's about um the karamaza brothers um see i haven't read it in a couple of years um, Dimit uh, who's the oldest? Dimitri is the yeah. oldest. Yeah. He's sort of a, 
uh, he's kind of more like his dad. He's kind of a libertine kind of playboy. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, he yeah he he likes to have a good time. He, you know, he's like he's kind of lively. Yeah, <laughs> he, he's got he's he's spirited. Yeah, and then but he's, got, been, he's got a good heart. Yeah. Oh no, he's a good guy. I liked him a lot. And then Ivan, he's probably Ivan's probably my favorite character. So Ivan's the second brother. He would you call him a nihilist? I mean, he's sort of like quasi socialist atheist uh he's close to he's you know he, uh, he's a little bit less ideological uh he's just more he's an intellectual and he's you know he's really he's pursuing as as Dostoevsky's intellectuals do the the the, the well theodicy you know the problem evil and the problem of you know why would god allow suffering um you know he has a sensitive nature yeah. Um, and, and he, it's, it's a great challenge to his faith, uh, to, or to any kind of notion of faith that, uh, God would allow, uh, you know, a small child yeah. to suffer and to endure, you know, tortures and humiliations and, uh, you know, be, be murdered by her parents so, you know that's the the story he relates in the book yeah. um and and you know dostoevsky was like he was kind of a uh he was kind of almost like a true crime type guy because he would his novels were yeah. uh oftentimes based upon the events that he knew about or read about or heard about you know from saint petersburg you know from like and saint petersburg has its own kind of like it's a beautiful city, but it's also like on this, you know, far northern swamp, you know, right by the, you know, the frigid Baltic Sea. It's a very interesting atmosphere. And, you know, it's, it's a little, I mean, it's a little bit of a, you know, like a dark Baroque type atmosphere. I mean, it's not, it's not super gloomy, but, you know, but there, but you can feel that, that you can feel the weight of history, you know, um, and, and certainly in Dostoevsky's time. Uh, so, so it's, he would, uh, he would, he would see these stories or he would hear about them and, and then, you know, somewhere down the line, they would appear in his works, you know, they, they would, he would reformulate them, uh, as part of his, his, uh, his, uh, more elaborate novels. Yeah. I ha I had read that. Would, would you say that Ivan is an, is an atheist? Uh, or an agnostic. <laughs> yeah, probably it's 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 tough to say. It, it, probably an agnostic, but he, he I th I think he's and it's been a little while since I've okay. read Brothers Karamazov too, but he he's he again he's tormented by the notion by 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 God by the existence of God. He's tormented by um you know the the metaphysical reality of you know, pure good and pure love, uh, and you know, uh, everything, uh, or, or rather, that God uh, has, you know, created us. While at the same time, we live in this fallen world where uh, we must suffer, and the innocent um, suffer, and the innocent are persecuted and abused. Um, and really there's, I mean, there's, I'm trying to keep my language right for the YouTube, but, uh, yeah, the, 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 the innocent suffer and are persecuted and abused by predators, uh, of various types, you know? Uh, so how, how, how do you, you know, how do you reconcile those two? And that's, I think that's what, uh, Yvonne is tortured by. Yeah. So he, I would think that he's, I mean, this is the way I thought of him. He's representative of some of the thought that was going on in like the into intelligentsia and the intellectuals like pre, pre Russian revolution. Yeah. Yeah, okay. definitely. Okay. Yeah. And, and that, that there was a whole, yeah, whole current of thought um, that, you know, included, um, you know, of course, uh, I mean, it really sprang from the, the Western Enlightenment, right? So, 
you know, atheism, agnosticism, deism, and then, you know, liberalism and, and of course, socialist ideas, you know, Fourier and all these uh, different, you know, uh, theoreticians of socialism and positivism and um, communism, yeah. all these, all these grand notions of uh, kind of uh, recreating man and recreating society and re-engineering um you know human civilization in in man's image right uh man is the measure of all things you know the it you know it 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 was you know i mean people look at the russian revolution and they think I mean, when when they think of it's it's remained in people's con consciousness you know from the cold war that russia equals communism or something um maybe less so today but still i mean it's still there you know among the older generations but communism was a foreign import you know that those ideas were not native to russia um Ger so germany yeah 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 germany and and britain you know i mean karl marx was writing from uh london you know and um so the, the, the i know lenin i'm getting ahead of myself because now we're talking about the revolution but I think Lenin was kind of inspired by the Paris Commune too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. From the, what was that? 1870. Um, Somewhere around there. I don't know. I was studying art during that period too, but I, yeah, yeah. That, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and of course the French revolution, you know, um, he definitely was. And, you know, Lenin was in Switzerland and yeah, um, yeah you know, plotting and, uh, it, it and and you know the the, the Bolsheviks were not they, they were they were not the um, you know again they were not the majority party they were they were considered you know more oh. extreme but they were able yeah. to take power yeah. that that's yeah. you know that's kind of the logic of nihilism in a way and um, and it's also but it also reflects the Russian mentalities it's very maximalist and so when you know in Russian culture if you do something you you go all the way and that's that's kind of what uh you know that's kind of and and that's very reflected that's very much reflected in dostoevsky you know he his characters embody certain ideals um certain theories and notions and he he basically plots out yeah. uh their course and the logical consequences and the outcomes where where it leads to yeah, they're you know? very they're very robust characters yeah. and then the other brother is aloysia yeah aloysia yeah aloysia yeah. i like it i like him too he um he was in the mon a monastery for a while and then he he leaves the the subplot around misha or aloysia i always had a little trouble with but um he's He's just a very good person. Yeah, I, his, I don't know how to describe him. Yeah, yeah, he I, he. Uh, there's no moral yeah, conflict in him. I don't think there there is. Yeah, there is a is latent. There? Okay, there's some latent moral conflict, but I think what what Dostoevsky was thinking about doing with Alyosha was he actually thought about um, writing another novel, kind of based on him, and it would be like it would be called like the the life of a great sinner and you know that would that would ex, that would explore you know and alyosha would you know have to undergo undergo great tests and trials and you know fall in in sin and get himself back up again and repent and um but yeah so alyosha is is but it definitely he's a, he's a very uh kind uh soul and you know very very christian um innocent uh and dostoevsky doesn't really his his test his trials you can see would come later you know um and they're not really so much in the book as as what you know alyosha would have to overcome in the future yeah so, and then we've got um, Shmerdikov. Yes, Shmerdikov, yeah. The, the yeah. bastard brother. Yeah. So he, the, the, the it, kind of like the integral relationship, I mean, in the book that I got was the one between Ivan 
and Shmerdakov because they have these interesting conversations yeah. about the meaning of truth and and um, what is truth and um, what is moral, what is ethical. And so Shmerdakov is the brother that kills the father. Yeah. But um, he's inspired by, and it always correct me if I'm wrong, he is inspired by his conversations with Ivan. Be exactly. Because, yeah, he, Shmerdakov is, I don't know, would you call him a simpleton? I don't uh you know he's not he's not really a simpleton um what but is he? he's he, he's just one of, you know like he's like he's one of those people you meet and they're just kind of off okay they're kind of like there's something off about them okay um there's something not quite right uh he yeah what's interesting about smenziakov uh dostoevsky was an amazing profiler and and psycholo practical psychologist. I mean, he's, you know, he's incredibly, you know, gifted in this regard. And with Smerdyakov, yeah, Smerdyakov, um, he is a house servant. Yeah. And, and the, even it's, the Russian. It's, it's really sad because yeah. it's, it's, I felt sorry for Smerdyakov because yeah. here's the three brothers and he's a bastard. So he's reduced to this menial position. I, I felt bad for it. I did. Yeah, I did. no, it is, it is sad. Um, so it is, it is tragic. Uh, what the other, the other key detail about Smedzyakov though, is he is shown to have these inclinations, these tendencies yeah. uh, to violence and to more, like he's, he's, he's just, he's like, um, he's not, I wouldn't say he's dumb. I mean, there's some element of, you know, animal cunning, Cunning, but he's kind of like a he's kind of like a lower type criminal so uh psychopath and this is even shown when he uh it's said that in his childhood he would um uh, torture and kill animals you know i mean that's just like that's that's dostoevsky being a criminal profiler right there you know okay this guy's you know this there's something really wrong with this guy he could be a serial killer and, and that's but but he's doing that before that sort of modern science yeah. that yeah you know. yeah yeah it's just like this you know he just had a very very keen sense of human psychology and uh could read you know could read people well um could you know he understood uh what these you know the significance of these different phenomena in in personalities I, I, I always thought of Shmerdakov too as because I don't I'm I'm kind of a a nurture over nature person. And I always because the the fa I can't remember the dad's name. Yeah, Fyodor. Yeah. Okay. The, yeah. the 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 father was not a, a nice person. Yeah, he was he was a complete abusive yeah, a complete jerk and you know was you know uh you, you, the the funniest one of the funniest scenes well it's when before he's murdered there's this scene oh, where i know which one you're gonna i think yeah I know. where he's where where he's, he thinks it's Grushenka. yeah yeah he thinks it's he, he think yeah he thinks it might be Grushenka, <laughs> the girl or or but he's also terrified of getting murdered <laughs> so he's torn between these two passions of you know of uh or you know these two you know strong emotions between fear for his life and <laughs> you know just, and the, you know this overriding lust like he's he, you know he's ripped apart uh by them yeah and it's just so silly you know he's made to look ridiculous you know and that's that that um there's even you know like the the church fathers uh they they talk about man being uh the laughing stock of demons when he's enveloped in the passions so you know it's just kind of, it, it very illustrative yeah that was a great that was a great scene yeah um he's he's abusive he's uh verbally abusive i don't know if it's it just a i a mean person so i could see yeah that, that's where, where smith yeah that's he's the product of that absolutely yeah and because i i remember aloysia specifically i remember if dimitri but i remember they did have memories of their mother who was a kind person yeah and Shmerdakov didn't have that. He just was abused. 
Right. So right, and yeah. that and that can that's that can be the tipping point. You know, I mean, yeah, it's not that there there are a lot there. You know, it's around one percent of the population uh, are considered. You know what they would term in the what is it, the DSM five or what cluster B personalities, right? Like sociopaths, psycho psychopaths, narcissists, and so on. Um, but there's that tipping point of uh, where where nurture comes in that can really create um, that or can that help create yeah. uh, a monster should someone be so inclined. Yeah. Oh. Um. The other, um, the, the aspect of the relationship between Ivan and Shmerdakov that I really latched onto because it, it, um, it kind of confirmed about something that I had written about and something that I had explored in some of my work and specifically about like, um, the sexual revolution, the the philosophy, or the thinkers, or the intelligentsia, or whatever, the proponents behind the sexual revolution. Um, some of them, I more specifically in like the the gay liberation movement, and especially with the Catholic Church, where I read a lot of these um, books and treatises and essays and whatever that these people wrote that sort of inspired people that read this stuff to live out those philosophies. I mean, specifically, I was thinking of one friend, I, I know you're not Catholic, but there was a Jesuit, well, you went to Georgetown. There was a Jesuit priest called John J. McNeil, and he wrote a book in the 70s called The Church and the Homosexual. And it was, you know, it I don't know how I can distill it. It's just sort of like a gay is okay. Well, it's more than that. It's like a good, God made me gay. God is good and everything that God makes is good. It's that kind of book. So I knew people of that generation who listened to what John J. McNeil said, put a lot of his theories into practice and ended up you know, dying of AIDS. So right. I was always interested in the idea of the person who philosophizes about something and then the person that puts it into practice. So when I went, when I read the verse, the brothers Karamazov, I was fascinated between that relationship with Ivan and Shmerdakov because Ivan is sort of the philosopher person who, who philosophizes out loud about this stuff. And then Shmerdakov is the one that puts it into practice. Yes. So that that's happened over and over again, I think throughout history. I mean, if you just look at the Russian Revolution, you have the intelligentsia, and then you had the mass of humanity where those, those ideas are put into practice. And it's usually not the people that philosophize or articulate those theories that suffer. It's the Yeah, ones... they don't have to pay for it, right? It's just normal, normal people, yeah. You see what I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that's that's exactly the dynamic. Okay. That's that's what's going on, and and you're right that that is a uh, that can be observed, you know, throughout history, and certainly in our modern history, uh, you know, people who come up with these abstract theories, um, when they're implemented in real life, yeah, uh, real people suffer and die, and um yeah and, and so the intellectual justification for sin uh <laughs> it, it does you know it doesn't lead anywhere good because it's gonna get when it gets uh applied in in practice then yeah that's that's the road to destruction yeah because i mean in in roman catholicism i mean which is the world that i just got out got out out of and it's always the jesuits so the um yeah, I, I went to, you know, I, I mean, I, I went to Catholic school. I went to Jesuit high school, you know, in California. So I, I know I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, they, they philosophize a lot. So, I mean, today in Roman Catholicism, the Jesuits are still um, proponents of, of certain, uh, I don't know, sexual uh, fetishes. And I'm just like, man, these guys live in their 
ivory towers, but people take what they say seriously and then they don't have to live with the ramifications. And that, yeah. that is really the worst. Yeah. And that's what, that was like, if I got like one thing out of the brothers Karamazov, that's what I got, but I got other stuff too. Yeah, no, that, that, that's, uh, that's central to the story, you know, um, that Yvonne and his theorizing, his, his intellectual constructions, um, those are carried out by uh, Smerdyakov. Smerdyakov is like, he is the, he executes Yvonne's will, you know, so it's, it's almost kind of diabolical um, in that, you know, Yvonne is being shown where his, you know, where his, uh, his grand constructs lead. Um, and, and again, and then you also have the key part of the book, the, 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 the poem of the grand inquisitor and it, yeah. And, you know, that's, that's about, you know, kind of a, a false religion of antichrist and the, um, the substitution of an earthly kingdom for the heavenly kingdom. And, uh, the, basically the, the attempted elimination of spiritual freedom, uh, for earthly happiness. And, and Ivan doesn't correct me if I'm wrong, but Ivan, when he's philosophizing, doesn't, or proselytizing or whatever, doesn't realize that how he's affecting Shmerdakov. Um, but but certain people again, this is something that that I've I've worked, that I've written about. Some, certain people are very susceptible to these type of suggestions or or these a new theory or new religion, like a father and Seraphim will talk about it. And Shmerdakov is that kind of person, you know, abused, traumatized. He looks up to Ivan very much so. So there are certain people nowadays who are very susceptible to uh, these sort of philosophies and then Absolutely. put them in your front hand. Yeah. And you, and you see the, you see the wreckage, you know, um, that's, that unfortunately is the, the entire story of the, uh, you know, the Western, Western Faustian man's experiment with, um, you know, the, the enlightenment, not, you know, not that every single aspect of the enlightenment is bad, but, yeah. uh, this, this has been, you know, the past few centuries have, uh, shown us where it leads, you know, to, to the attempted annihilation of man's, uh, internal spiritual freedom. Yeah. So this, I mean, what makes a book or an artwork timeless is that it, it continues to speak. And this book, it's not just a bunch of about a bunch of dead Russians. I mean, what it what it talks about is still relevant today. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um and the yeah with the 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 dynamic between Ivan and Smerdyakov and also uh the poem of the Grand Inquisitor. Mm. Um and and just the the overall you know the at the end of the book the the hope for salvation and you know belief in the resurrection um yeah that it's very it's extremely powerful and and dostoevsky um you know i i believe was inspired you know uh in in, in a good way yeah I, i'm going to i'm going to hit you some with some quotes here um, I, these are from my notes. Uh, whenever I read a book, I, I take co just copious notes. Um, I think a lot of the, one of the stupid things I did is I didn't write the character that said this stuff. But I think a lot of it's Ivan. So he wrote, or he said, the world has proclaimed the reign of freedom. Oh, this is so good. The world has proclaimed the reign of freedom, especially of late. But what do we see in this freedom of theirs? Nothing but slavery and self-destruction. Damn. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and, and I'm very interested in the sexual revolution. So, um, in the West. So that was all about the freedom 
to explore sexuality, any kind of physicality that you wanted. It was about freedom. But what has been the result of that freedom? Yeah. Definitely slavery. People are addicted to porn. There's uh, people are addicted to sex addictions, Viagra, uh, and now self-destruction through STDs, AIDS, uh, uh, um, uh, um, antibiotic resistant gonorrhea and cl- yeah, right. it just it just gets wild. I mean, monkeypox, you know, it just gets wild and wilder and wilder. Yeah, I don't mean to laugh, but yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, that people haven't figured that out. That freedom is not all. It's it's freedom requires. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci said something about art, and he said it. You need restraint. Yeah, he yeah, said yeah. Great, great art doesn't come so much from freedom, but restraint. Yeah, uh, they they have to work together, and um, you know I think it's a false freedom that's that's kind of proclaimed where uh, man man is uh, proclaimed he's he's he said that he, he's free to be enslaved to his passions, right? Um, and the the funny thing is is that there are all these parasitic entities um, at various levels that are there to exploit and manipulate those passions in order to further enslave people. Um, so, you know, whether that's multinational corporations who are just making a buck or the, you know, the, the people who produce porn or whatever. And, um, or yeah, I guess we're not supposed to say that word on P O uh, prawn uh, on, on, we're not supposed to say that on YouTube, but the, um, I mean. yeah, I mean, there's just all these language rules, you know, that, so uh, where was I going with that? As well as, you know, as well as on the spiritual level, you know, the demonic, you know, people, people are um, unfortunately manipulated into uh, being enslaved in this way. Yeah. And they, but they're told they're free, right? They're told they're ne- they've never been freer in history. Um, yeah. It's never been better. It just keeps getting better. The, the more uh, rights uh, multiply, you know, and now, you know, and, now there's so many um, different uh, sexual identities, you know, they, they just, they spring up like mushrooms and there's no end to it, but somehow people aren't getting happier or at least the, you know, you could see the, the despondency in the Western world um, with, you know, the epidemic of uh, drug addiction, Suicide. suicides, you know, just, just demographic uh, spiral. Psychotropic uh, drugs. Yes. That's what I was talking to, to David about, you know, hallucinogenics. Big yeah, people, right are, people are, you know, and, and they could be at various places in their lives. Some people, some people want to find the truth, um, you know, and, the, and they're, they're earnest and they're, they're sincere about it. It's just they're, they may be uh, looking at the wrong places, you know, or, or they, they may not have had, you know, uh, the exposure to, um, you know, classical Christian understandings or, or, or it was, you know, it was kind of, um, that's a given. Yeah. yeah, It was, it was, uh, they were, they were told that, no, that's, that's old fashioned and silly, you know, or so, uh, but yeah, people are, people can be deceived and, and, but then again, they can see the truth. So, uh, yeah. So not all hope is lost. Oh, no, no. And I think women in particular in the West have been, I think, devastated, um, because of, of the sexual revolution. I thought it, I think originally thought it would free women up from the burden, you know, of, of um, becoming pregnant and, and having to bear the responsibility mainly of, you know, a, a, a one night stand or something. But I mean, women, I think particularly, particularly are unhappy. Um, yeah, the destruction of the family, it's, it's hard on everyone, but certainly, I think I think you're right. Yeah, I th- I think you see that. I, correct my pronunciation because you have a you have an accent. Grushenka, Grush, Grush, Yeah, yeah, Grushenka. Yeah, Grushenka. She's really interesting. I liked her a lot. Yeah. Um, she's she's very much I thought kind of a modern woman. Um, she had this affair when she was I don't even know if you'd call it an affair. She had a 
she had a liaison, a romance. I don't know what you'd call it. She was quite young with this older guy. He was uh, in the service or the army or something. And yeah, I think it was a Polish officer or something. Yes, and he dumped her. And yes, it, and that, it, that scarred scarred her psyche. Yeah, you got it. It devastated yeah. her. Yeah, and yeah, so, so common a story. And and we have there's a lot of people running around with scarred psyches, and they're they have that trauma. And they, you know, but they can't dig themselves out of the hole. Yeah. 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 Dostoevsky could write women that because some, the theory, he's a man's, I always think of as more of a man's author. But yeah, he gets, he gets into that. He gets in that mindset, you know, like that, like it it often gets like really funny, you know, when they get into like hysterics and stuff and and then they just go off, but it's, you know, you could just imagine, you know, a certain maybe woman in your life or, uh, and not in a bad way, but just, you know, when they get like really worked up. Yeah, he he captures it. Yeah, he he has a lot of empathy for her, and yeah. and and then I did as as the reader. So I mean, that's how she gets involved with Dimitri, and and yeah, it's it's I I could relate to her because um, something devastating. I, I thought she was abused as a young girl, so something abusive like that. Yeah, it 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 sets you up, and it it sort of plays out in the rest of your life. And you see that with Kushenka. And yeah. um, he just, yeah, Dostoevsky can apprehend the depths of the human psyche <laughs> of, of both men and women. It's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah. So a man who lies to himself and listens to his own lie comes to a point where he does not discern any truth, either in himself or in anywhere or anywhere around him. And thus falls into disrespect towards himself and others not respecting anyone he ceases to love and having no love he gives himself up to passions and coarse pleasures in order to occupy and amuse himself and in his vices reaches complete bestiality and it all comes from lying continually to others and to himself yeah yeah and and satan is the father of lies oh uh, but you know like as as you see that that is great i think that's i think that was said by elder zosima if i'm not mistaken but in in the book and he's he's another great figure um but that is true both on a personal individual level and also at the level of a culture and a civilization and i think what we're seeing right now with the the west is a culture that has lied to itself um, you know, for decade after decade and, you know, in the, in the, you know, in the grand, you know, kind of metaphysical religious plan, you know, century after century, but has, they have, the culture has lied to itself and the lies just keep piling up on top of each other. And now it's imploding under that weight. And and we have reached a level of bestiality. And this is coming yes. from somebody that got into some weird scenes and the stuff that's going on today i'm like whoa yeah it's it's bestial yeah yeah i go this and it's sad a... because even with um you know Not like good. just the weird stuff like furries uh i mean that that sounds like that oh, sounds so quaint now <laughs> that's the, <laughs> you know yeah. but but um but they, they're into some they, they can get into dark stuff too but the um the fact now yeah. it's now it's uh, Mark. They have these other kins, so yeah. you identify not so much as a different gender. You're, but... you're like a big squirrel or something. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We're, I wanted to say um, that... but see that. I'm sorry. Let me interrupt you real quick. Yeah. Because before I lose it, that's where it ties into the Ivan Shmerdikov thing, where the theory. Because I've seen people like talk about this stuff online about other kins and other identities but some people the susceptible people play it out because i've seen them in san francisco they actually play this stuff out in real life yeah yeah and um yeah and with the i mean that that's the other thing is that with the rise of you know information technology communications um the the speed with which an idea a, a you know some kind of um 
deviant or perverse idea can be manifested into real life uh, just accelerates. Yeah. yeah. And so, and that, and that of course, just um, speeds up social chaos. Yep. Uh, but yeah, I, I was just going to say with the, yeah, the, the furry stuff or people thinking they're <laughs> dragons or whatever the, the um, you know, ma uh, man has his nature and, and that was given by God and the, and the, the the animals have their nature um and and all of that is good but when man uh descends to animal level he's not really he's not like the animals that that is something much worse he becomes like the demons yeah. you know when uh when he when he's bestial yeah i went i was out reaching this a couple of years ago years ago in san francisco and there was a uh, they had a dog pen set up on the street and there were actually guys in there acting like dogs. Right. Right. I was like, wow, this isn't good. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It just gets, and, and there's no, there's no, like, there's no stopping point. Right. It's, it's like, it's not like um, there's some limit that gets reached and it's like, Oh I, no, everyone's happy now. No, no. The, the, these, these disordered passions, go on forever they're an abyss and yeah. they will they will continue um to get weirder and darker and you know um you know to the point where there's like you know that the super bowl halftime show will have you know human sacrifice or whatever it it just goes there's the trajectory is there yeah um is there beauty in sodom believe me that for the immense mass of mankind beauty is found in sodom did you know that secret the awful thing is that beauty is mysterious as well as terrible god and the devil are fighting there and the battlefield is the heart of man that reminds me of solzhenitsyn yeah yeah solzhenitsyn i think taking uh from dostoevsky said something very similar but yeah the, the okay, human Alan. Yeah, the, the line cuts across. I have it. Yeah, the the line market. separating good and evil passes right through the, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and the, yeah, Dostoevsky said, you know, the human heart is the battlefield between God and the devil. That's that's where they fight. So it's, and that's so important to remember to not, um, you know, classify, you know, to, to uh, demonize people or to make them, uh, uh, what, what some people tend, you know, tend towards that to, you know, oh, these are the children of darkness and these are the children of light, you know, and uh, no, it's, it's, we're, we're all human. We're made by God. We're made in his image. Uh, we should love one another. And when people fall into evil, um, that's a great tragedy, but it's not that they were, they were never inherently evil. Um, you know, they're, they also are worthy of salvation. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, every, everyone just needs, you know, everyone needs to turn towards God um that you know certainly me yeah yeah i get that i because i was a real freak so i mean i i get that this is one of my favorite quotes um from the book because when i read it i was like yeah that that was me because i'm a karamazov because when i fall into the abyss i go straight into it head down and heels up and i'm even pleased that i'm falling in just such a humiliating position and for me i find it beautiful that that is where you get to the darkest place possible and you've lied to yourself so intensely and repeatedly that everything that is sick evil twisted and dark becomes beautiful and you go with it you go with it like he says you're just falling heels up head down yeah i've been there that that's profound that's real yeah yeah yeah. it's a spiral yeah um yeah and it takes takes incredible courage to get out of there um or god yeah no that's 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 exactly yeah the two the two work together yes um <laughs> but uh i was gonna um remark on karamazov yeah the, the interesting thing about the symbolism of the name is uh karamazov is is another symbolic name in dostoevsky because it means basically uh, black anoint, like black anointing. So 
So kara, kara I didn't know that. Is, yeah, kara is actually, it's a Turkic root for black. But it's very common in Russia because of the Turk, you know, the plenty of Turkic tribes riding around. And, and um, you know, I mean, even today, you know, you have like the, the Tatar people, you know, around, uh, you know, Kazan and Astrakhan um, by the Volga River. But uh, so kara means black. And then maz is like... Um, is like to uh it's it's a way of uh pamazanya is is anointing so so karamaz means black anointing you know dark anointing so there it's it's and it really is like um i mean you could you could kind of see it as like a it's like a general not i wouldn't say a generational curse but yeah um it it is it does show you know a dark inclination of fallen human nature. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's kind of what the Karamaza family, you know, exemplifies. Yeah. yeah. Let, here, let me speed up on Dostoevsky. Um, nothing is more seductive for man than his freedom of conscious conscience, but nothing is a greater cause of suffering. You know? This is, this is really an important one too. If there is no immortality of the soul, then there is no virtue and therefore everything is permitted. That's where we are today. Yes. Yes. And that's, that's where, yeah, everything, you know, that's, that's why, that's why you have major cities looking like Lord of the Flies. Yeah. Or Gotham. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Gotham. Yeah. With, uh, <laughs> what, with the, uh, the mayor of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot, who looks like a character out of Batman, you know. She does. She does. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, that's where we are. That's, yeah. wow. Anyway, okay. Um, damn, I've kept you a while. Let's let's talk about the Russian Revolution real quick. I love the Russian Revolution. I wish I could talk about it for like days. Um, okay, where do I start? Where do I start? Oh, let's start. I'll say, okay, Alexander the Second is Nicholas's the Second grandfather. He is assassinated, right? Yeah, Alexander the Second. Yeah. So things, you know, before the Russian Revolution, things weren't always great in russia yeah there was there was already a, uh, there was already a level of political destabilization yeah yeah and, um, and you have really. these sort of like we talked about with the brothers karmasa you have this intellectual milieu of nihilism atheism uh uh anarchism i don't know you know uh revolution yeah. you know absolutely so and then alexander the third i really like he's interesting so he's like a bear of a guy he's like the russian bear he's a yeah. big guy he's a romanov big romanovs a lot of times are tall and posing and that's alexander the third but and i think he would have been a good czar i i think if he would have lived i wonder if the russian revolution would have taken place yeah a little bit longer uh i know it it the whole the entire thing looks like you know just this one event after another, you know, kind of piling up into this historical tragedy. It's like yeah. an opera, yeah. So um, he dies very young. I can't remember, 42, I don't know, 40s. So his eldest son, Nicholas II, who is small, stature, sensitive, a good guy, faithful to his wife, faithful to his kids. I, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to say. So... Um, and then he's got his own trauma. His he has four girls. Finally, he has a son. Uh, there's I don't know how you say it, primogeniture. There's no you have to have a male heir. Yeah, the male heir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I think they did that after Catherine the Great or something. But um, so Alexei is born and he's hemophilia. <laughs> yeah. And there's no, I guess they had a treatment, but there's no cure. So um, there's that problem. And then in the family, gosh, let me, let me try to think. George passes away, his brother, George. And then there is Mikhail, who I really like too, Grand Duke Mikhail, but he marries a twice <laughs> He marries a twice divorced woman and he's kind of in semi-exile. 
So, I mean, the pressure is on Nicholas. So Alexei is sick. I, I don't know. So the, the, the balance of power in the Romanovs are, is really teetering. Yeah. And then you have, you have the disastrous events of the, the Russo-Japanese war, the 1905, yeah. you know, liberal revo revolution. Bloody Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you, could you tell people just real quick what Bloody Sunday is? Cause it seems like in my reading of Russian history, that's where it really turn, takes a turn for the worst. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. There was a there was a massacre um, that occurred in in the in 1905, and uh, there was a priest named Gapon, uh, G A P O N, I believe. He, he's he's interesting. <laughs> yeah, and he and and he his his associations are very uh, uh -huh. shady as well. Um, and that and that's one thing to remember is that. Yeah, like, and Dostoevsky, he also, he he really, like, when he wrote about, like, in, in the book, uh, Brothers Karamazov, like, the seminarian, Rakitov, or no, sorry, Rakitin. If you remember Rakitin, uh, he was a uh, seminarian, and he was just a clod, but he, he was also, you know, kind of one of these uh, overeducated bozos yeah. who thought they were smarter than they were. Um, and, you know, and wrapped up in, you know, theories of, uh, you know, the, the, whatever the latest um, political and theological fashions were. Um, and, and again, this was from an Orthodox seminary. So Dostoevsky was very critical of Orthodox seminaries in, you know, the late Russian Empire because they were producing these types like Gapon, you know, um, in Gapon, the, there was a... Uh, there was, it was like, uh, there was a riot and people, people were killed. Uh, I, I believe it was, I think some Cossacks wrote in and so, yeah, it was, but that was used, you know, to, uh, further destabilize, uh, the political environment. And, you know, ultimately there, were, the, the parliamentary system with the Duma was introduced, you know, and, um, uh, and then, you know, 12 years later, you had the, the February revolution, yeah, when I and that was that. that was another liberal revolution that, uh, again, there's there's no uh, there's no halfway pregnant. They uh, eventually the Bolsheviks were able to, you know, take advantage of the chaos and impose their will. Yeah, and then the the battleship Potemkin is in 1905, isn't it? So there's some problems going on in the military too. Isn't yeah, that yeah. There were various mutinies. I would have to look. Gosh, I, I'm not. I think, as, it, I think it was 1905. Yeah, I'm not as well versed on that period, but yeah, Pachomkin. Um, yeah, there, there, were, uh, there were there were problems with uh, <laughs> soldiers and sailors uh, who were also swept up with revolutionary ideals at this time. Yeah, and then you have um, one of my favorite characters, of course, Rasputin. So um, yeah, yeah. Who was yeah also very much uh, an ambiguous <laughs> figure, and the yeah the interesting thing about about Rasputin was he. Uh, I I'm not quite sure if he was totally the villain made out in history. There are, uh, I think you're right. Yeah, there are certain. Uh, well, there British intelligence had it out for Rasputin, supposedly. And they were, um, they played a hand in his assassination, which was done through uh, Masonic Lodge contacts as well, you know, by these Russian nobility who were members of- Oh, uh, Prin uh, Prince, you, you, Prince Yusupov. Yusupov, you, you yeah. Yusupov. He's, yeah. A he's a character too. Russian yeah. history is so interesting. Yeah, these guys were weird, um, but, but <laughs> yeah, uh, but- yeah, Yusupov, I believe, was was a Mason. Um, and, you know, British intelligence is famous for using Masonic lodges. Uh, yeah, as as kind of uh, their as cover for operations. I, I think I think I don't want to take too much of a deep dive with you, but I think within the Romanov family, there was definitely an interest in getting rid of Rasputin because they felt that he was really bringing down the prestige and the trust that the people had in yeah. the, the, the royal family. Because 
Alexandra is very interesting too. Um, uh, Nicholas II's wife that there, I mean, unlike a lot of royal marriages, that was a love match, actually loved each other. But she is, um, how did it go? She's the granddaughter of Queen Victoria. So her mother was Princess Alice, who was um, Queen Victoria's daughter, one of her daughters. But Alexandra, talk about trauma and childhood. She had a very traumatic childhood. Her mother died very young. One of the other children died very young. I forget a blood theory or something. And she had a rather cold upbringing with her grandmother in England. And um, she had a tough life, even though she was like a noble gentry. Yeah. And um, that was, I think, reflected in, in her marriage. She was very devoted to her husband and her kids. But there was a very intransigent kind of Victorian strain that went through her. And I think that's just how she dealt with things because I think she had a traumatic childhood and um, I think she was just very orderly. And I think when, and I think Nicholas to his fault, when he went to the front, I think he put, he kind of put her in de facto charge in Petrograd, in St. Petersburg. And um, she couldn't bend. She couldn't, she wouldn't bend. So I think things were happening very rapidly in Russia and she just, she couldn't cope with it. Yeah, the force of events was such that, yeah, he he wasn't, you know, unfortunately he wasn't really up to the job. Um, and neither, and neither was she. Yeah, no, no, yeah, certainly not. I mean, if he was delegating to his wife, you know, the Empress, it's, that yeah that there wasn't uh you know this uh a professional leadership cod cadre the way that um there should have been of course but yeah that that and that i mean that 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 entire period you know that saw the downfall of you know uh three major empires so uh you know russian austro-hungarian german and well, then also the fourth uh, the the ottoman empire so yeah. And and, yeah. and the and the British took a took a hit. hit yeah, yeah, hit. The, yeah. The yeah. British Empire was was nearing its end as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's there's two revolutions in 1917. There's the you mentioned it. There's the the February, which is that was kind of a popular up. Correct my 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 reading of Russian history. It's kind of a popular uprising, but it seemed to be very. Um, endemic to St. Petersburg because there were food shortages and um, the, the people uh, the people revolted and broke into various you know places to get food. Well I that was kind of the, the, that that was kind of the uprising of of of, of uh, February and then of course um, it was very the, it was very it was popular among the elites among the intellectual classes. Wasn't yeah, it they, among the the populace too? At least in St. Petersburg. Yeah, yeah, in the in the major cities too. An Factory extent. workers. Yeah, um, and and the generals turned on. Um, they turned on Nicholas. Right. So yeah, yeah, so things were so unstable in the capital that they felt that the only way to create some sort of stability is was for him to resign, and he did. Yeah, yeah, he he was made to abdicate and. Um, yeah, no one really stood by him and yeah, it was, it's, it's all very tragic. Uh, and then of course, you know, you have the provisional government of Kedinsky who the was, Duma. yeah, yeah. And, and Kedinsky, uh, you know, another like Westernizing liberal type who really was ineffectual and hapless. And then, you know, that would be swept away by the Bolsheviks. And it's, it is interesting that, that with the passage of, you know, a century, um, there's some kind of, there's at least a, a reconciliation. I mean, which just, you know, by, by force of time kind of happens between the red and the white mentality. And it's like, well, you know, they've gone past that now they're, <laughs> they're Russia. Right. And that, and that, but the, 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 uh, one, of you know, one of the major positive aspects of that is that, that, orthodoxy has you know has returned to russia and 
um, that after the fall of the Soviet Union slowly but surely has been, you know, regaining uh, its place, you know, among the people. So, uh, and, and that again is, you know, a slow and imperfect process, but. Um, yeah, so, so Mikhail and actually the whole family, well, no, Mikhail is, I think is a martyr in the Russian Orthodox Church. Gosh, is he? I would have to. I, I, I think, have to I think in, I think in Rokor. Yeah. Um, but the uh, the whole family is what do they call them? Um, passion bearers. Yes, passion bearers. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, um, at the cathedral in San Francisco, you can, you know, they 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 have their icons there, and they have some relics from, you know, uh, uh, Alexei and and uh, Nikolai uh, Lazar. So yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. So by um, October of that year. I heard, I read something that a Russian historian said, and he said that the October revolution wasn't so much a revolution, but a coup. And that made yeah. a lot of sense to me. Cause I think like we think of like the Russian revolution in, in movies, like the peasants with pitchforks, you know, right? but it really, it really wasn't. It was, yeah, it was um, a seizure of power, you know? Yeah. 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 These, you know, by by force of arms, you know, we're able to seize the popular assembly and, and, yeah. and the Bolsheviks, I think you've mentioned this already, the Bolsheviks were a relatively small group. Yeah. Yeah, they were not the they were not the intellectual majority, right? And and, and that that's funny that it, because you can see this throughout history, right? If 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 you have a you know committed group uh you know a, a smaller group, but in, in, you know, they hold to extreme ideals, but they're disciplined and willing to, yeah, willing to use force and uh, put it on the line, then they can seize power. And, you know, it wreak, wreak, uh, you know, all kinds of damage. Um, you know, it, this, 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 I mean, you could look at the French Revolution, of course, as well, but. Um, that that I would say had more of a popular uh, backing than the the Russian. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think I think so in a way. But what about this, Mark? Because this is where this is why I kind of wanted to go down this this road. Is that the Bolsheviks? The Bolsheviks were a lot of people didn't take them seriously. Like I don't think anybody in nineteen seventeen like early 1917 would have imagined by the end of that year, the Bolsheviks would have been, right. you know, relatively in charge. And I think in the United States, you've got to look at this too, because like most Americans are not, don't buy into like wokeism, but it's a small group of intellectuals. Right. Who are that, backed. Yeah. By, backed by financiers, right. Backed and so were the, the Bolsheviks. You're right. Yeah. Yes. Yes, backed by multinational corporations, you know, who have these alliances with uh, major financial power, and that enables them to impose their agenda. So it is it is possible for a relatively small fringe group to seize power. Yeah, and I mean, we <laughs> see, yeah, and and you know, I mean, the, you could say, I mean, if you look at it this way, like we're we're you know, the American population, you know, the majority of the American population, you know, doesn't subscribe to these ideals, but uh, the, the small fringe group is, uh, has the support, uh, the financial support, uh, logistical support, and uh, com media communications backing from billionaires, you know, who, who really are the fringe weirdos who are pushing, you know, the uh you know drag time and library or whatever these type of phenomena uh they they're but yet you know this this 0.0001% is pushing their agenda on everyone else yeah the actually the 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 transgender the transgender uh uh um I don't know what you call it. What the hell do you call it? The transgender activists, activists is, is, is kind of an interesting parallel to the Bolsheviks because they are a small group, but it's interesting how they've been able to dominate 
the the conversation yeah it's sad uh yeah it's it's a it's um there it's it's again it's the the case of um taking uh what some people what what some affliction you know a limited number of people suffer from yep. and and then turning it into a wider social phenomenon and encouraging it uh you know encouraging you know it's it's kind of a you know it can be like into like a meme or a mind virus a pathology that is then uh spread into the wider population when you know again i think for any the the god god is a uh god is not a harsh judge god is meant to heal us and he is he is the divine doctor you know so he he's yeah. meant to you know like he, uh you know communion confession the sacraments like that's that's our spiritual therapy for everyone so that and that's the therapy that we all need not uh not whatever is cooked up by social engineers yeah um and you know these wacko ideological audio you know very uh these toxic billionaires yeah yeah so i'm gonna i'm gonna segue from I, and I think I can do it from transgenderism and the French and the Russian Revolution to Father Stefan Rose because I think the motive behind a lot of these um, uh, these identity wars and these culture wars is the meaning of truth, especially with gender. If there is no gender, then I think truth is kind of off the yes off off the table. So Father uh, wrote. For the question of nihilism is more profoundly a question of truth. It is indeed the question of truth. And, and that, that was brought, I'm trying to, I always try to do this in, in my podcast, and sometimes I do it and sometimes I don't. But, um, and that the truth was also um, um, a major theme in, in the brothers, uh, Karamazov, the idea of truth and lying to yourself. Yeah. And is, is there truth? So a father is wrestling with those same things in, in nihilism. And I mean, the, the Soviet nihilist, or I shouldn't say the Soviet nihilist, but the, the czarist era, you know, Russian nihilists were hardcore. So I think that's, I, I, I don't know the history of nihilism, but I would say that's kind of where it, it really begins to, become a, a force a great yes. force yeah in in modern history so yeah and if you look uh seraphim rose you know he he the, i think i think nihilism was was in large part inspired by dostoevsky um and also uh by uh turgenev um turgenev I don't uh, know yeah our uh, fathers and sons yeah Ivan oh yeah 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 i've yeah. never read it yeah uh so Dostoevsky kind of took off from fathers and sons in the, in the novel demons. And it's about, you know, these, uh, the, the generation of the, uh, earlier Russian liberals in the 19th century who give birth to, uh, hardcore committed nihilists. Yeah. And that also charts out, uh, a trajectory of, intellectual development and uh also a political program so it's the the um liberal ideas will ultimately give birth to nihilism yeah. um and that's and and liberalism is just kind of this you know i mean and i, I speak of liberalism in, in the widest possible sense and in, in or in the broadest possible sense in terms of philosophical liberalism classical liberal liberalism uh you know the the enlightenment ideas that are uh you know that m modern conservatives you know hold dear uh those those are just uh you know kind of the midway point towards a uh more full-throated nihilism yeah and and father talks about um discussing truth it it's it's not just a philosophical question or problem it's 
it's theological. It, it's it's about God, and he and he quotes Nietzsche's famous, you know, God is dead. And he wrote, uh, and he wrote, we have lost our faith in God. There is no truth. This that is to say, we have become uncertain of everything divine and absolute. So so integral to that that nihilist outlook of truth is is an atheistic view of the world yeah yeah it's incredibly deadening uh <laughs> because m man killed god in his heart mm. western man killed god in his heart and uh erected new gods in in uh in his place uh so you know western man murdered god um and you know created all sorts of idols to replace him although that emptiness can never be filled you know only god can do that yeah Th this quote um yeah it's really good to maybe read brothers karamazov and then read this book but you don't have to but it's weird because it's a lot of things like in this book, then remind me of uh, Dostoevsky. Father wrote, it is an attitude of dissatisfaction with self, with the world, society, with God. He's talking about nihilism. And that, that reminds me of what Dostoevsky talked about with freedom resulting in slavery and self-destruction. Because a lot of these especially subcultures, um, it creates dissatisfaction. And what you see, I think, in modern society is people who have a lot of freedom to do what they want with their body, uh, and they have a lot of technology, but they're still very dissatisfied. There's a, there's a great dissatisfaction in the world. And that, that hence... The, product, the byproducts of that are bitterness, anger, resentment, hatred. Yeah. And yeah, this is like, you know, Pascal said, man has a God-shaped void in his heart, you know, and, and, and it can't, yeah, it can't be filled with any of these other um, false gods, you know, that we, we attempt to put in there. Um, that, that's what people try to do. Yeah. 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 It, 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 it's sad because I don't want to say that that I know the truth. I mean, I'm trying to understand the truth, but that that truth I do get. And it's it's sad when you see people who who spend their lives, you know, struggling in that that place. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So it is that at the present moment of man's spiritual history, a moment admittedly of crisis and transition, a dead God, a great void, stands at the center of man's faith. That's what, yeah. you, just that's what you just talked about. Yeah, uh, these words are, you know, I mean, Father Seraphim Rose, he was writing in the early 1960s, and yeah. yet... <laughs> Uh, it, and we look we, we look back on that period as something, uh, uh, as, you know, oh, it's quite idyllic. You know, it's right before, you know, the Beatles came and all the hippie stuff. And, you know, uh, and, you know, like uh, people on the right will say, oh, you know, everything would be would have been fine if it weren't for the hippies and uh, <laughs> and the, the free love counterculture, all that stuff. But they don't understand that. Uh, that was just an outgrowth of, uh, that was a symptom of, of a sickness within Western society uh, yeah. that was very deep. He, he was in San Francisco, you know, during the late 50s and, and 60s. I think they left in 1970 or 69. And uh, so that was all the seedbeds of what we're dealing with, with now. Yeah, the summer of love and the sexual revolution and the counterculture. So, and he was, he was critiquing, well, he, he's really interesting. I, I love him for many, many reasons, but I mean, he was sort of immersed in that world at one point 
and then he critiqued it, you know, very early on. So yeah. he could see where it was, where it was headed. And this is where we are. So. Yeah. The, the power of the world, which nihilists trust as Christians trust their God can never liberate. It can only enslave. Yeah. That yeah. Sounds will, like right. Yeah. That sounds like right. Like right out of. Yeah. The world, the world enslaves and devours those who bow down before it. Yeah. And that's straight out of the brothers. I mean, yeah, yeah. it's the God of nihilism. Nothingness is an emptiness, a vacuum waiting to be filled. Okay. You talked about this. Those who have filled in this vacuum and acknowledge nothingness as their God, cannot but seek a new God and hope that he will lead them out of the age and the power of nihilism. So you talked about that with the, with the, you know, the God shaped hole. Yeah. And there's always this expectancy, you know, this, this, uh, this kind of um, atmosphere of apprehension or anxiety for the new, the coming new religion, right? And then we see a lot of the UFO alien stuff, you know, oh, maybe, maybe these will be our savior. The aliens will come and, you yeah. know, show us how to be peaceful and, uh, you know, live as one world or as, and as well. And this ties in with the, you know, the, the general uh, trend towards uh, trying to create some kind of global religion uh, that, effectively preaches a false christ yeah. um so yeah it, whenever whenever there's a vacuum it, it's going to be filled and this and this applies to society as well the, the public square is not a vacuum it will be filled that's why the the libertarian classical liberal theory of the public square just being an idea of uh or sorry being a a platform for free exchange of ideas no there it will be one side or the other will uh, ultimately uh, determine the direction of society. So it can't mm -hmm. just, it, there's no, there's no neutral space in actuality. Yeah. And, and I think there's a, there's this false belief that when these movements, these modern movements, let's just say like the women's movement reaches like a nexus or a theophany, let's say like 1973 with Roe v. Wade. Um, the everything subsequent to that will be like a glorious renaissance period. But in truth, I mean, women have advanced in terms of uh, like the the capitalist system, but mental illness is is higher than yeah, ever. Mental illness is off the charts. People are not happy. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, again, there's they're they're employed by corporations, and they've expanded the the tax base, you know, to twice the size uh, by by the those reforms, you know, with Gloria Steinem and um, you know, uh, just the, the entire um, yeah, and that that of course has has social engineering roots as well you know that was backed by the big foundations and the cia um yeah. so the the nothing when you fill this nothingness up with something out of the work out of this world it just makes things worse and um i i know that firsthand Th this quote from father seraphim in my twitter uh in twitter you can put a few things in your whatever it is so I have this quote from Father Seraphim. He, he who does not live in Christ already lives in the abyss. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that clarifies things. That's a dark, it's a dark place. I've, I've, been, I've been there. Um, is this my last quote? Okay, this is my last quote from Father this is really profound. And I think I talked about this with Father um, Deacon Ananias. Disillusionment, in a sense, is preferable to self-deception. It may, if taken as an end in itself, lead to suicide or madness, but it may also lead to an awakening. 
So this is kind of, that sounds like harsh, but that's, that I think is a great, a great lesson in hope because I think people are profoundly disillusioned. I mean, right now in America, I think just in the West in general, people are profoundly disillusioned with, with their, with their political systems. That's why people, there's so many, especially young people are playing around with ideas of, you know, anarchism and communism and socialism. And, and they have no idea what they're talking about. And there's, there's all this, these things, all of these niche, you know, fetish groups with sexual orientation and, and gender and because people are profoundly disillusioned. But I think what Father talks about here is true, is that in that disillusionment, there can be an awakening because, and that's how I got out of the, the, dark, the dark world I was in because I was disillusioned. And then um, I said, well, there must be something else besides this. And that is perf preferable to self-deception because self-deception is like, in the Brothers Karamazov, where he talks about when you when you lie to yourself to the point where you don't know the truth anymore, and that's that's the worst place to be, isn't that? Yeah, self? then then you're really dwelling in the abyss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that is it's a great it's a great great book. I wish people to read. Hey, look, it's like yeah, thin. it's it's a it's a thin one, but it is you can read it over and over, and it's it takes it takes time to let's see, really uh fully uh understand there's there's just so many passages in there you could read them over and over again and come back with new ideas or new uh new reflections each time and that's that i love that about uh so there was his first that was the first book by father seraphim rose that i read but yeah yeah it's that's terrific yeah i think i think orthodoxy in the religion of the future that's was another great one yeah my yeah. first one i i kind of wanted to I'm trying to wind up because I've kept you too long. I want to talk a little bit about this. Um, and I, and I wanted to go back to Russian history again, because I kind of feel like history does repeat itself. So father wrote this in this way, the new religious consciousness becomes an enemy of Christianity that is much more powerful and dangerous than any of the heresies of the past. When we experience as MS, what we experience as emphasized of doctrine, the normal Christian safeguards, which protects one against the attacks of fall in spirits are removed or neutralized and the passiveness and openness, which characterize the new cults literally open one up to be used by demons. So I think what father is talking about when experience is emphasized above doctrine, and I see, I see this everywhere because yeah. like a key word right now in like pop psych or political discourse or online communities is lived experience. Mm -hmm. Have you heard it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, and, yeah. Another cliche and, now. And the other one is my truth. Yeah, my truth. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> So I think, I mean, Father's talking about this before any of us even hit. So it, it's very, very dangerous that, that we're in this like super relativistic world where experience is profound and it's above doctrine. I see it in Catholicism a lot. From it's everywhere. Yeah. It's, it, it, it does permeate throughout society and, and religious movements too, that, that is a, it's a very dangerous, um, I, well, it's a very, it's, it's, it's a kind of a trap where, um, people think that because they are experiencing something or experiencing, uh, whether that's emotions or some kind of, um, psychic or, uh, pseudo spiritual, um, you know, like they, they get, they get like a good, they get, you know, kind of a, like a good vibe from, uh, 
you know, a, uh, an event or, or they get, or they, they meditate and it produces certain results. Um, and, and maybe it changes their consciousness that that somehow points them towards what is actually true. Um, they, they are, they are definitely, they're using, uh, spiritual techniques or, you know, like developed by yogis for thousands of years or, um, you know, they're, they're engaging in, you know, what may be like initiations, you know, into, you know, different, um, cults or, uh, religious movements, but that's not to say that just because they feel something that's, that, uh, at first is positive means it's necessarily the truth. This, yeah, that's, that really is the, um, the, the false notion of, uh, experience over doctrine yeah and there's there's a reason because we're 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 supposed to be from everything i've read from you know the 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 church fathers and the gospels is that we're supposed to be sober in yeah. our assessments and sober in our perceptions and not to when when we do um come across or encounter spiritual phenomena uh we're not to be trusting uh, we're not to be uh, to just automatically assume that it's from somewhere good or that it's from God's angels that because the the fallen angels love to uh, pose as uh, you know the saints or as angels or as uh, God's messengers when they are not and and they, that's that's part of how they ensnare people and spread false messages and uh, it's, it's a very, um, and that's why they, they call it spiritual warfare, but it's, it's a very, uh, complex and, uh, uh, it's a complex, uh, type of conflict and it requires a very refined, uh, sense of discernment, which most of it, I mean, you know, most, most of us don't have, so it's, it's just it's just better to not involve oneself in, in those things because there's, there's too much um, going on there where we can be deceived and uh, led astray. Yeah. W what, I wanted, what I wanted to get your opinion on too, real quick, is that um, what I was thinking about with that, that quotation from that quote, from Father Seraphim about a new religious consciousness that's based on experience is that um, what I see now, especially with these um, with these like political action groups, mm -hmm. is that people's lived experiences lived experiences experiences very profound, and it takes on sort of a, a religious connotation. And I think back to the early Bolsheviks, and there's an author, Helen Rappaport, who's done a lot of stuff on, on Russian uh, liter the Russian history that's really good. And she looked at the, um, I guess you'd say profile of the people that actually did murder the czar and the children. And they were hardcore Bolsheviks that had been pretty brutalized. And I mean, Lenin, Lenin had been sent to Siberia, and I think Lenin, Lenin's brother had been killed, and I think that had a profound effect on him. Mm -hmm. I think during the assassination of Alexander II, which we talked about, he was involved in that, and, and Stalin, of course, not so much Trotsky, but these were angry people, <laughs> yeah. that, and, and I think... Um, in, in the Western world, we have people now that have been brutalized in a different way by, um, you talked about it, the, the breakdown of the family. They've, their, their childhoods have been chaotic. And, um, and then just the, uh, the decadence and the, uh, the filth of, of modern culture, pornography, and violence. So, uh, there's people that have been traumatized, and I think that's why there's such a big upswing of these these young men who are who are mass shooters. But also, just the other day, 
I saw a survey that more young people are in favor of political assassination. So, I mean, when you think of a small group of people who are angry, bitter, and from a traumatized childhood, that can turn into a, a, a societal cataclysm. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. And we're already seeing, the stage is already set and we've already, we're, I don't know, we're, we're, we're a couple acts into the play. Um, you know, the events of two years ago are, I mean, and that, that also uh, with, with the, uh, the riots across the cities. Yeah. Um, but that, that looked to me like um, something you would see when the U S government wants to overthrow a foreign country's government, they will uh, have, you know, uh, a coup. Yeah. yeah, they'll have, they'll, they'll stage a coup, but they will, make it so and they'll send these cutthroats in who will be like you know they'll they'll be like um i can't say the word but uh t-e-r-r-o-r-i-s-t-s oh yeah, uh, yeah. and and they will they, but they will say that they're peaceful protesters and the media will repeat that line that these are peaceful demonstrators uh and you know but they will uh get really violent and they'll end up seizing power uh, for whatever um, agenda that, you know, the government is pursuing. And, uh, you know, th there's the, the famous headline, the CNN headline, uh, fiery but mostly peaceful protests in, you know, one of these towns in Wisconsin or whatever. It's just, and that, that just struck me as something that CNN would do uh, in a foreign country that had been targeted uh, for regime change. And so, I think I think there is you know there's a top down social engineering uh, agenda to it, but but you're right. This is leading ever more to, and people who think they can control chaos uh, are wrong, and it spins out of control and it goes in directions that aren't necessarily um, conceived originally by by people you know by the early you know say uh, the major um, business backers of the socialists and Bolsheviks in the early Re Russian revolution, uh, they weren't expecting that would end in a full hardcore communist takeover. You know, they, uh, they had their, they had their designs in mind, but, but, and they helped unleash the chaos. So they, yeah. they, uh, you know, they, they sowed, they sowed the wind and they reaped the whirlwind. Yeah. I, th I think the, what I think what a lot of people I think early on when things weren't going well for the Romanovs was that they were headed towards a constitutional monarchy. I, I, I think that's what most of them thought. None of them dreamed that, that the Soviet would take over. And, yeah, yeah. And, and, and what worries me too is that, and I'm thinking of St. Petersburg in February 1917, is that I think what sparked a lot of that, and a lot of women were involved, is that um, the lack of food, uh, the lack of, of, of bread, specifically bread. And I mean, people flipped out in this country when toilet paper yeah. was uh, hard to come by. Yeah, that's, that's very you, telling, isn't it? Yeah. Can you imagine what would happen if... Yeah, if, when we're already projected to have a food crisis and shortages uh, across the world. Yeah, this is, it's not looking good. <laughs> so yeah, um, it, who knows where it will go, but uh, things, you know, I, I, for the past couple of years, I, it, there's just been a, I've decided that the general rule is that things will get weirder and crazier. And, and I haven't been proven wrong so far, so. No, and, and we have no idea that if things do become very um, chaotic, we don't know who will, who will ultimately end up on top. Yeah, 
that's not clear at all because um yeah there are various scenarios but things things could fragment very yeah. easily um and i think again for historical parallels uh in this case the end of the soviet union is uh has a lot in common with america today and where we are the the fall of the soviet empire this is we're now at a time where the american empire is um you know accelerating towards uh its end that that would be painful but ultimately i mean if we look at russia um and i'm just thinking of the faith the russia has had a massive resurgence of orthodoxy i mean if if you want to know where christianity is growing it's in russia yeah <laughs> it's it's not in the west <laughs> no it's it's not in the west unfortunately you know and that's that's tragic yeah um <laughs> yeah russia had to suffer a lot yeah. uh and especially in the 1990s um early 2000s uh life was really rough uh for for most russians um and they had to you know the the phenomena uh of the post collapse soviet union um you know included demographic problems which they're still um you know kind of getting their grips on as well as uh all the all the social uh pathogens and also that were only accentuated by the new openness to the west and western culture and and it took them a while to get back on their feet um but yeah russia as we can see is is doing that now um and i think america once the empire once i mean we do, we don't know how it's going to play out but we can hope for a relatively soft landing we can pray for that and i think we should um because it, we're we're at a very uh crucial moment um and it's very dangerous both both in the international arena uh as well as uh internally in the united states you know and especially in the big cities um and we should all hope that uh <laughs> that we can get through it without massive bloodshed because typically when empires fall it's accompanied by um violence on a major scale civil war yeah um yeah the russian civil war was a mess too yeah um so my hope is that i mean looking at russia because you know during the soviet occupation during the the communist um there were people who kept alive uh their faith you know people kept there were people in russia who kept a vigil light burning in front of their icons there were a lot of there was a lot of martyrs yeah yeah there were there yeah there are amazing saints even during the soviet period there was like oh yeah saint luke of crimea uh yeah these these brave men who you know kept the orthodox faith going and for america you know i hope i we hope got that it. yeah we can we can have uh some of that strength uh that they showed um and there's even i believe it was uh an elder ignatius ignatius who was quoted by father seraphim rose you know and he said around the time of the Rus russian revolution i think he was from from harbin which is in northern china but uh it was a, you know it was a um a russian city uh back during the tsarist empire but uh, you know, like kind of around Manchuria, but uh, Ignati said, uh, "Today in Russia, tomorrow in America." Yeah. So there's, you know, and we can kind of see uh, that unfolding. So yeah, so 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 individuals as well, but families just need to keep their faith alive, know the truth, and tell the truth 
every opportunity. I mean, I do it in a small way. I do it on Twitter. I do it on Facebook. Who wants to listen can listen. And, and I think if, if, if the truth doesn't, and it, the truth will never completely die. It didn't in Russia. And I don't think it will here in America. And I think um, God will always, God will always win in the end. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. As long as, yeah. And, and, you know, uh, as long as there's love and repentance, there's hope for us. So, you know, whatever small, small little spark of that there is, you know, God, God extends his mercy. Yeah. Even, even in communist China and Maoist China, it, it's, it's surviving. So, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it, it can do it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, th- hey, thank you, Mark. God bless you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Joseph. I had You're a great welcome. talk. You're welcome. Yeah.